Good afternoon from Manila. My name is Samuel Tumiwa, and I'm the advisor for fragile and conflict affected situations. I will be the moderator for this session. To begin, I would like to introduce the ADB Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development, Mr. Bambang Susantono, to give his opening remarks. Thank you, Sam Tumiwa. Excellencies, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. First, let me welcome all of you to the sessions on building resilience in fragile, conflict-affected, and small island developing states. Over the last half century, Asia and the Pacific has become the fastest growing region in the world. We saw how hundreds of millions have been lifted out of poverty, and many countries emerged as the new economic and technological powerhouses. However, progress has been uneven and the divide is widening in the wake of the pandemic. It is most timely, therefore, that we launch today the ADB FCAS and SITS approach, or FSA 2021-2025, to make a better positive development impact in those countries most at risk of being left behind. Countries classified as fragile and conflict-affected situation, or FCAS, and small island developing states, or SITS, face issues rooted in their specific context. Some examples include weak institutional capacity and governance, conflict, vulnerability to economic shocks and natural disasters, forced migrations, and climate change. Add to the COVID-19 pandemic to the mix, and the challenge of economic growth and poverty reduction rises significantly. ADB Strategy 2030 calls for differentiated approaches for the FCAS and six countries. Without this, our vision for a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific cannot happen. Currently, there are 11 ADB developing members considered FCAS and 16 recognized as SITS. As many as eight fall under both. Bringing FCAS and SITS under one umbrella, our new approach focuses on the similarity in the drivers of fragility and their effects. This makes ADB and its FSA unique among development organizations. However, each country has its unique context, different history, different governance, different level of fragility, and different needs for their people. Thus, a differentiated approach is needed for each as well. The FSA uses context-specific and risk-based solutions to inform decisions and improve operations. The video will highlight some of this. So let me briefly share two examples of what ADB has already started doing differently in the FCAS and SITS context. One is the increasing use of digital technologies to compensate for the remoteness or inaccessibility of FCAS and SITS countries. Technologies can also help projects be more cost effectiveness, particularly in this challenging operational context. We have began using remote sensing technology in projects from drones or satellites to gather and assess data as we monitor progress, identify risks and problems, and assist in finding the right response. Another example is ADB 2017, 2017 Procurement Policies and Procedures for FCAS and SITS members, which allow for greater flexibility, but without compromising the integrity of the process. The FSA will build on this ongoing initiative and help ensure we provide the best possible support for these countries as they transition from fragility to stability, resilience, and social cohesion. For those affected by conflict, the FSA also identifies and tackles the specific key drivers of conflict. It emphasizes the need to force even stronger links with our members, donors, development partners, and other stakeholders. Partnership will be the key to successful implementation of FSA. On that note, I'm delighted we have such an outstanding panel of representatives to share their different perspective on the issues of fragility. We have ministers from both SITS and FCAS countries, global development partners, and our own ADB colleagues. I look forward to learning how we can continue to help each other and build sustainable solutions to address the specific needs of this developing member. Thank you.
Thank you, Vice President Bambang Susantono, for your inspiring words. As mentioned by Vice President Susantono, today we launched the FCAS and SIDS approach, or FSA. The following session is structured to highlight how the FSA responds to the challenges, needs, and requirements of FCAS and SIDS, and why this is important from various points of view. You can see this from the profile of our distinguished panelists today. As Pak Bambang said, we have invited guests from FCAS and SIDS governments, guests from bilateral organizations, civil society, and our own institutional representative. We will hear from each of these panelists and respondents through a short four minute statement before proceeding to a question and answer panel session. And then Bruno Carrasco, Director General of Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department will sum up the event. The chat box function will be open after the short statements and the number of questions we take will depend on how much time we have left. We only have an hour for this complex and interesting topic, so let's get at it. Since we launched the FSA, let me share a brief background on its preparation. The FSA was prepared through an iterative process of analysis, consultations, integration, and adaption. We reviewed previous approaches for FCAS and SIDS, held an initial round of consultations last October to December with a wide group of stakeholders, casting a wide net to be very inclusive. We engaged with over 400 people in over 40 meetings across 23 countries to identify critical issues and discuss effective um, and implementable solutions. We met with counterpart governments, donors, development and humanitarian partners, international organizations, and civil society organizations. Based on this, we undertook a detailed problem analysis. Then we developed a theory of change to improve the effectiveness of ADB assistance and enhance the development outcomes of the FCAS and SIDS. We studied ADB's internal policies, processes, and procedures to find out where and what we could do to, over the next few years to ensure that we are flexible and adaptive to what each country needs. Then we drafted the FCAS and SIDS approach. Early this year, we shared the first draft of the FSA and held a second round of consultations. We engaged with even more stakeholders in the second round, reaching out to almost 400 people through more than 35 feet meetings and briefings. We worked hard to polish each line of the FSA and are proud of the work that has been done. We also undertook a briefing to our board of directors and it was just approved by President Asakawa last Thursday. We have prepared a video explaining the FCAS and SIDS approach and what we mean to do with it. To provide more context on the rest of the session, I present to you the FCAST and SIDS explainer video. ADB's vision for a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia and the Pacific cannot be fully achieved while pockets of fragility remain in some countries. Issues such as weak governance, poverty, remoteness and isolation, unsustainable debt, extreme effects of climate change, conflict and violence, including gender-based and ethnic violence, are all causes of fragility. ADB's work in countries facing these challenges has been less successful when compared to elsewhere in the Asia and Pacific region. This implies that ADB cannot continue doing business as usual and follow the same processes, procedures, and practices in these countries. A new fragile and conflict-affected situations and small island developing states approach has been developed to improve ADB's operations and ultimately improve livelihoods, inclusiveness, and resilience in these countries. Our operations must remain agile, flexible, and acutely responsive, with the COVID-19 outbreak adding urgency to this task. The new approach is built on three pillars improving ADB responsiveness, increasing institutional capacity, and enhancing understanding of developing member countries' contexts. Its underlying principles include flexible business processes, procedures, and practices, introduction of fragility and resilience assessments, context-driven and risk-informed decision-making, and optimizing adequate resources and strategic partnerships. Under the new approach, the way ADB prepares its country partnerships strategies, designs its projects, oversees their implementation, and sets and monitors its performance targets will be even more tailored 
to the specific context of each country. This means a shift to enhanced understanding of the context and adapting to it. ADB will work closely with its clients, make changes, and increase flexibility to its processes and procedures to make them more responsive to the specific needs of FCAS and SIDS on such issues as social and environmental safeguards, procurement, and financial management without losing their integrity. In Afghanistan, a fragility and resilience assessment was prepared to better inform the country partnership strategy 2021 to 2025. This assessment focused on deepening ADB's understanding of the various constraints faced by the country and the interaction between such fragility drivers and ADB's sectoral interventions. It identified factors that can act as sources of resilience going forward and provided concrete recommendations on how to make ADB's operations more effective, sustainable, and resilient to the changing context and contribute to the country's efforts towards peace building and stability. The multidimensional nature of the fragility and resilience assessment required close coordination with other assessments being prepared as part of the Afghanistan Country Partnership Strategy process. While in Tonga, a context-specific solution was introduced using innovative financial instruments and strategic partnerships. ADB private sector operations and the Pacific Department teamed up to design and develop a credit enhancement mechanism to support the credit worthiness of power utilities, where government guarantees cannot be given. The Climate Resilience Project was bid to the private sector through a transparent tender process. By encouraging new modalities and working with both sovereign and non-sovereign operations, ADB is helping Tonga step into its renewable energy future. Overall, this new approach will help ADB serve better the poorest and most vulnerable people in the Asia and Pacific region. Our esteemed panelists today come from all parts of the world. We have asked each of them to share their thoughts before we go into the question and answer session. First, we welcome His Excellency Minister Alfred Alfred Jr. of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. Minister Alfred is serving his second term as Senator and was appointed the Marshall Islands Minister of Finance, Banking and Postal Services early this year. He was also previously the Minister of Resources and Development and the Secretary of Finance. Minister Alfred, good evening to you. Uh, good evening to everybody. Excellencies and ladies and gentlemen, greetings of Yahweh to you all from the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And as introduced, my name is Alfred Alfred Jr. And I am currently serving as the Minister of Finance for the Republic of the Marshall Islands. It is indeed my pleasure to join you virtually in this event, focusing on building resilience in fragile, conflict affected and small island developing states. Before I proceed, I would like to acknowledge and express my appreciation to the Asian Development Bank for arranging this important event, and more so for inviting a small island developing state from the Pacific to participate in this dialogue. I am privileged to be able to share our experiences and policy lessons in the context of resilience building in the midst of a pandemic and from the viewpoint of a small island developing state faced with the real challenges of climate change. The very first point that I wish to make is that climate change is real. Barely two meters above sea level with very narrow land structure and no mountains, we are already seeing the painful impact of climate change in the Marshall Islands. Rising sea level, more extreme weather, more frequent drought, and continued inundation of habitable land by sea waves are some of the new realities that we see on a daily basis. Just last week, when we had the highest tide of the month, the airport on one of the outlying atolls was reported to be completely submerged with salt water that had literally risen from the ground to render the airfield 
not serviceable. On a nearby outline at all, another outline at all, where field trip ships are the only link to the main commercial centers of Maggio and Ebay. Goods from ships are loaded onto smaller boats and carried one mile onto the shore to be delivered to their owners. Only because the dock, the only dock on the island, has been destroyed by changing current pattern and strong waves. And on many other islands, roads are being destroyed by encroaching seawater and communities being separated as a result. These are just a few examples of how climate change has made lives in the Marshall Islands more difficult. And these are also specific examples of what many of the small island developing states are currently facing. Many of us in the sits face the same structural constraints, as in small size, remote location, narrow resource base, and extremely exposed to natural disaster and the impact of climate change. The second point that I wish to make is that resilience building from the viewpoint of a small island developing states will require a high degree of emphasis on rebuilding basic infrastructure and climate proving them. As basic infrastructure is a prerequisite for effective provision of essential services. But the island nation geography leaves it more exposed to extreme weather events including tropical storms, wave inundation, and droughts. The resulting aftermath of these events threaten the very infrastructure that provide vital services. Therefore, it is important that small island developing states are able to make better informed investment decisions when it comes to designing and building infrastructure that can withstand climate change driven threats. I am grateful to note that the ADP's FS approach has provided some synergies in which capacity development and private sector engagement can be leveraged to arrest the negative impact of climate change. I uh, look forward, so as my um, colleagues in the Marshall Islands and the small island developing states, look forward to engaging with Asian Development Bank in bringing forward these synergies for the betterment of our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Alfred, for your time today and the special points that you made on climate change and the vulnerability and how they need to be addressed. Uh, we will call you back on screen during the moderated panel session. Thank you again. Now we welcome His Excellency, the Acting Minister of Finance of Afghanistan, Mr. Khalid Payenda. Mr. Payenda is a distinguished economist and previously served as the Deputy Minister of Finance of Afghanistan, as well as the Director General for Macro Fiscal Performance. I worked closely with Minister Payenda when he was the Deputy Minister, and I was the ADB Country Director in Afghanistan. Minister Payenda, Salaam Alaikum, Khobasti. It's very nice to see you. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. Uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good day, good afternoon, uh, and good morning to, to all of you. Uh, it's, it's good to see you, Sam, and, and uh, ADB colleagues and co colleagues from international development agencies and, and other uh, 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 government uh, and, and, and organizations. I'll so speak a bit about uh, our type of challenges. Um, it's, it's impossible to speak to this, uh, this forum without acknowledging the gravity of situation in Afghanistan. In an already difficult uh, situation, the international withdrawal presents us with our biggest challenge of the last two decades. It is quite literally a question of survival. Uh, uh, can our country as uh, leadership uh, come together and make peace and build an inclusive coalition or will withdrawal send us back to the nightmares of the 1990s? While these are now the, in the hands of our 
leaders and diplomats, but we, partners in development, including ADB, are not passive to these uh, events. Uh, what ADB and our government does matters to the outcome. Our people are tired of the problems of conflict and a lack of delivery of services. Uh, it's so it's a very tough environment where we're dealing with, which requires uh, agility and in approach, innovation, and in how we tackle problems, and with a decreasing envelope of resources, how we efficiently make use of, of resources. Addressing shocks such as the COVID uh, shock uh, that uh, squeezed our purse with uh, revenue decreases as well as expenditure increases and have have had impacts, you know, and we are still struggling with, with the aftermaths of it. Uh, but given this this bleak situation, we also see uh, an opportunity, an opportunity to get things back on track, to make sure that if our resources are used efficiently and with ADB's help, how we can uh, improve the delivery of services, uh, uh, preparation of uh, projects, implementation of mega infrastructure projects. I believe uh, this provides a unique opportunity to look into the FSA and how it's implemented in Afghanistan. Uh, I look forward to the rest of the discussions today and the Q&A session. Uh, uh, happy to be part of this, this discussion. Thank you very much, Mr. Banda, for your statement today. We also have on the panel two very important people. First of these is Ms. Christine Totsky, the Director of the German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development. Christine will give us the donor perspective. She has served in Afghanistan, has a lot of experience on operationalizing these types of strategies. Over to you, Christine. Thank you very much, Sam, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, first of all, I really would like to congratulate the ADB for the new FCAS and SITS approach uh, and also for convening this very important meeting. We knew even before um, the COVID-19 pandemic that development engagement in fragile and conflict affected situations, but also in SITS needs a special approach. But the COVID-19 crisis has worsened the situation. In these countries, it has unveiled vulnerabilities and it has added a crisis on top of already existing ones. And the Minister of Afghanistan mentioned that it, this um, just recently. Um, and this means that the ADB's commitment to pay special attention to FCAS and SITS through a differenti differentiated approach really comes at the right time. It is particularly important in the implementation of the Asian Development Fund. I would like to highlight three elements of the approach which we as Germany um, definitely welcome. First, you have to know the context. And we welcome that now in order to design a program which considers the specific situation of FCAS and SITS needs a thorough assessment of the country context. This is crucial. So we applaud the bank's commitment to further develop the fragility resilience analysis on the basis of a standardized framework and systematically integrate them into country partnership strategies. Each situation is different and we know standards are needed, but we should always be beware of blueprints. I am particularly pleased that these assessments will cover multiple dimensions from disaster risk and chain, climate change, governance and conflict. This is important as they are usually interlinked. Second, special skills and tools are needed. We also welcome the element of strengthening the internal capacity. In order to truly adapt the bank's way of working, ADB will need to ensure that its staff is properly trained, but also incentivized to work in these FCA situations. It's all about putting on a so-called FCA or SITS lens. I'm pleased to hear that staff trainings are planned. 
they need to be offered in a systematic manner. Third, one thing is certain in FCAS, and that is volatility, which means a constant and regular update, monitoring and measuring results is needed in order to adapt and to respond flexibly to the realities on the ground. And I can see that this is adequately reflected in the proposed results framework. Some might think that the approach sounds a bit technical, but I can ensure you that this is really the hard work. I know that very well from my own institution. But also please allow me to make three recommendations. The first, buy-in from management will be important for the success of the approach. It will be crucial to ensure it is operationalized, particularly with regard to the provision of the necessary resources, including the staffing on the ground. Second, not everything has to be invented from scratch. A lot of experience exists within other multilateral banks and institutions. The World Bank adapted its FCV strategy at the beginning of 2020. And that is why we explicitly encourage ADB to work closely with other MDBs on knowledge and exchange, but also on the ground. And I'm pleased to hear that a harmonized approach on FCAS classification is planned. And third, we would also encourage ADB's efforts to strengthening the humanitarian development peacebuilding nexus. For example, by participating in country-based forums with actors across the HDB nexus and by reaching out to, for example, UNHCR and UNDP. This is part of a sound and efficient multilateral collaboration where each organization can bring in its strengths. Finally, we ask ADB to inform the board regularly about the rollout and progress on implementing the FCAS and SITS approach. I thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. And your advice and recommendations on getting buy-in from government, um, collaboration with the other MDBs, and uh, the humanitarian peace development nexus is very well noted. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we will, uh, we will be hearing from Mr. Riontoro Morotani, the head of the Office of Peacebuilding at the Japan International Cooperation Agency. JICA has been a strong partner with ADB in our development work in FCAS and SIDS. Please go ahead, Mr. Morotani-san. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Sam, for giving me the opportunity. And excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon and good morning. I would first like to uh, congratulate ADP on the successful launch of the FCAS uh, CIS approach. Uh, JICA has been privileged to be invited to the prior consultation, and I am thankful for, for that. Uh, the key messages, uh, such as context-specific approaches, importance of fragility analysis, institutional capacity building, a partnership, all resonate with JICA's approach towards FCB. So I am very glad to be on this panel today, as, as, as well as I am looking forward to working with ADP uh, on this important subject. And, and I also like to uh, emphasize that the, in the context of Asia Pacific, fragility is multidimensional. There are risks of violent conflict at national level, and at subnational levels as well. But in many countries and areas in the region, there exist uh, multidimensional risks and fragilities. The vulnerable populations to conflicts are also vulnerable to varieties of shocks such as poverty, natural disaster, climate change, infectious diseases, and so on. And the COVID-19 has demonstrated how the risk in public health can cause multidimensional shocks to the people's lives and the shocks are particularly acute to the vulnerable populations. And the Pacific Island countries are facing their particular fragilities to natural disasters and climate change, and we need to pay special attention to it. Against these multidimensional risks, JICA applies human security approach. A human security approach is people-centered, prevention-oriented, and multi-sectoral approach, because we believe 
that the lack of development, lack of strong health systems, of job opportunities are all potential causes of fragility and conflict. So we work with partner governments uh, through their capacity development to build inclusive and resilient uh, institutions and economy that can deal with multiple threats to people's lives and livelihood and dignity. And one of the strongest, uh, biggest efforts on FCV in the region is our cooperation in Mindanao in the Philippines. JICA has been actively supporting the region since 1990s, and now we are working closely with the Philippine government, as well as the Bansamoro Transitional Autonomous Government to help realize the peace process uh, from the development perspective. In order to achieve inclusive and resilient development in the region, our three priorities are, first, strengthening the governance, second, uh, community development, such as agricultural development, and third, socio-economic development. In supporting the transition towards the Bansamoro gov uh, Bam government in 2022, we are building up a new government governance mechanisms that was agreed in the peace process. So the BAM government is striving for fair recruitment and fair training opportunities. We are building a new mechanisms with, with a new people. So human resource development and institution building is very important for the system so that the system will function and achieve uh, to achieve uh, inclusive, resilient and sustainable development in the region. Uh, we are facing the new challenges because of the COVID-19, but we are working with, uh, with the government and local communities to realize, uh, to, to, to create an inclusive and resilient economies so that people can, uh, people can enjoy the peace achieved through the peace process. Thank you very much, Anna. We, I am looking very much forward to this session. Thank you. Thank you, Murakani-san. Thank you also for bringing uh, the topic of subnational pockets of fragility and subnational issues of conflict. Uh, thank you very much. Um, rounding out our panel is our Director General for the Pacific Department, uh, Ms. Leah Gutierrez. Over to you, Leah. Thank you, Sam. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, joining us virtually from many different parts of the world, good day and good evening. I welcome this opportunity to share some perspectives of our operations in the Pacific, where we continue to help the governments of our 14 small island developing states tackle the challenges, fragilities, and vulnerabilities described by today's distinguished panelists. Overall, official development assistance in the sub-region is growing, driving evolving economic opportunities. Our work with the Pacific governments is guided by ADB's country partnership strategies for Fiji and Papua New Guinea, and for the 12 smallest SIDS by the Pacific approach, which is in the process of final preparation for the period of 2021 to 2025. The Pacific approach is our multi-country partnership strategy, guiding ADB investment and non-lending activities across 12 SIDS. For 2021 to 2025, it is proposed to support a resilient Pacific and help the governments to, one, prepare for and respond to shocks, two, deliver sustainable services, and three, support inclusive growth. Today, I would like to share how the proposed Pacific approach will help ADB further expand its differentiated approaches in the SIDS, including SIDS that are fragile and conflict-affected situations. I will start with the most immediate and fundamental threat to the Pacific, climate change. Climate change is an existential challenge for the SIDS with the window for taking action closing fast. Accordingly, the proposed Pacific approach, approach seeks to build climate resilience holistically. This will support necessary data collection and planning to develop the most appropriate investments. We will work with the Pacific governments at national and project levels to identify the root causes of climate-related vulnerabilities and deliver more comprehensive support. Another critical area of engagement in small island developing states is capacity institution and institution building. The challenges in the Pacific sits in this area are well known. Small populations lead to capacity constraints. The Pacific approach will scale up capacity building 
and have capacity supplementation to address skills gaps. Compliance with ADB and other MDB processes can be a daunting prospect for capacity-strained SIDS governments, leading to delayed projects and delayed development impacts for the people of Pacific. The proposed Pacific approach will provide greater flexibility to apply more practical differentiated approaches. For example, the use of a one consultant, one project approach. Also, to coordinate with the World Bank and other institutions on procurement. We will keep exploring new process innovations to make complex procedures more user-friendly for the SIDS. Recently, ADB prepared a fragility assessment for Papua New Guinea to better inform ADB's new country strategy of the, rel of the relevant fragilities, political economy, and multidimensional causes of vulnerability. We are now designing the tools to integrate this context-specific knowledge through all our operations from country level um, strategies, uh, from country level strategies and help us design better operational responses. Lastly, being in country enhances understanding. Over the past three years, ADB has opened 11 Pacific country offices in SIDS to complement our existing two sub-regional offices. This allow us to talk regularly with governments and they strengthen ADB's understanding of local challenges. They also provide us an opportunity to provide hands-on support for implementing projects, monitoring progress, and addressing challenges. In closing, the, future, uh, the proposed Pacific approach and the AFCAS and SIDS approach complement each other and connect to several other initiatives across ADB. The Pacific Department of ADB looks forward to sharing your experiences and expertise to collaborate on and successfully implement the, if, the AFCAS and SIDS approach so we can help the Pacific SIDS build resilience and a stronger future. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you, Leah. And thank you for the colleagues in the Pacific Department for your guidance and your cooperation and collaboration as we were preparing the FCAS and SIDS approach. And we look forward to implementing both the FCAS and SIDS approach and the Pacific approach going forward. Now I'd like to invite Ms. Sana Johnson, the Vice President for Asia and the, uh, from the International Rescue Committee to respond with her thoughts on what the panelists have shared. Sana, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, your excellencies, uh, first, uh, we would like as International Rescue Committee, thank the Asian Development Bank to, for inviting us to this important event. I would also like to take this opportunity to send a special thanks uh, to Mr. Samuel Tomavi and his team for the extensive consultation that has taken place with us as civil society actors. It has been much appreciated and very instructive and informative. I represent the International Rescue Committee, uh, who responds to the world's worst humanitarian crisis and were founded in 1933 by the great Albert Einstein. Today, we are active in over 40 countries and in 20 states, uh, cities in the United States. Our dedicated teams provide clean water, wa shelter, health, education and em empowerment to support refugees, displaced population and host communities. In Asia, we have been active for over 40 years with immediate life-saving work and development actions, serving over 25 million people in, 19, uh, in 2020. This we do together with 60 national partners, but also partially uh, self-implementation. The IRC believes that ADB's launch of its no approach couldn't be more timely as the world is on fire. The current scale of human displacement is staggering. Today, due to conflict, wars and climate impact, we have 80 million people split between internally displaced and refugees fleeing for their lives. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken millions of lives, increased poverty levels, increased protection risks for women and girls and shed a devastating light of how ill-prepared our national health systems are to respond to health outbreaks, not the least in fragile and conflict-affected states. 
We know that the half world's maternal mortality occurs in war torn states. Children living in countries affected by humanitarian crisis accounts for nearly half of all under five deaths. Countries affected by humanitarian crisis accounts for 43% of all out of school children at primary and lower secondary levels. Not the least, we have to acknowledge and recognize that girls are women and girls and women are subject to increasingly unimaginably violence when they flee, when they live in refugee settings and are trying to build new livelihoods. This means that the need for aid is larger than ever, and especially for fragile and conflict ridden countries. But it has to be a better aid, a coordinated one. So despite the fact that fragile states produce over 60% of the world's displaced and host nearly half of the world's displaced and 43% of the world's extreme poor, they receive only 30% of the over total overseas development assistance. And this has to change. We also know that despite the best of intention in many low and middle income countries, Development and humanitarian institutions and actors work on different time scale with different funding streams and different assumptions. Regrettably, therefore, the sum of the interventions are less than what they could be. Until development and humanitarian players, players working in the same countries with overlapping populations share context analysis, client feedback, program interventions and effective utilization of operational means and performance metrics. We and they will continue to operate silos in silos rather than in tandem. That it means in its simplest terms that we humanitarian and development actors guided by what the population we serve are asking for need to work hand in hand and be more flexible, agile to assure the future we all want to see. That's why the launch of ADB's new approach is both much needed and welcome. It connects to the nexus and the operationalization of key actions, from the risk-based strategic planning to design, monitoring, evaluation, the integration of technology and capacity building. And critically, critically the approach highlights and emphasizes the need for a very strong gender perspective. These areas are all areas where we as the civil society actors are uh, constantly investing in too, why we hope for further elaboration and collaboration with ADB. Once again, congratulations to ADB. We are looking forward to the rollout and to collaborate with you as we are moving forward to assure the best interest of our clients and for a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Sana. I would like to thank all the panelists once again for being here today and working with us in support of the FSA development. Now we would like to call everyone back on screen and begin our panel discussion. You'll see that there are question and answers in uh, questions, sorry, in the uh, in the discussion panel. And perhaps the first one that I see uh, that I would like to put to Minister Alfred Alfred and uh, Minister Payenda. Um, so, the, and, and this is a question that, that has been, uh, has had the uh, most uh, requests to be asked is, um, as the ADB Vice President noted, um, the significant economic growth in Asia and the Pacific over the past half century that has brought millions out of poverty. He also said that no country uh, should be left behind from this economic growth. This question really is for the what needs to be done by FCAS and SIDS or by donors or by the ADB to make sure the poorest and most vulnerable countries are indeed behind. Uh, please keep your answers to about a minute or two. Thank you very much. Maybe we start with Minister Alfred Alfred. Uh, thank you very much, Samuel, for, for that uh, timely question. 
given the launching of the uh, SCAS SITS approach. And um, from the pers perspective of the SITS, I, I would say that the, the approach is um, uh, uh, the, the, the approach is well well timed, given the uh, pandemic and the um, negative impact that we continue to face from climate change. It provides some synergies in which uh, we can uh, we, we can easily apply to all the different situations in the uh, that, that are being faced by the by the sits. The flexibility that is encapsulated into the approach take into account, the different uh, level of exposure, uh, as well as the uh, different stages of development that each of the sits are uh, are facing at this at this stage. So I would uh, very very much uh, commend the Asian Development Bank not only on the launching of the approach, but as well on the uh, the the uh, the scalability and the flexibility that is encapsulated into it. I think it's a uh, it's a pathway in which the the SITS can meaningfully engage with with the Asian Development Bank to to ensure that uh, no communities in the SITS are left behind in terms of their vulnerability to to climate change as well as to natural uh, disasters. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Samuel. Thank you, Mr. Alfred. Mr. Painda. Um. Yeah, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, uh, a few points. Uh, I think it's important for ADB to uh, uh, operationalize the or change its operations based based on the risk analysis of the FSA done uh, to get maximum use of the resources at hand and including the private sector. Uh, the analysis uh, has been done. Uh, what needs to be done is the implementation of them in, in, in our context. Uh, we also know that uh, many projects do not perform well because they are not designed well. And one, one aspect of it is, is, is based on the uh, fragile situation that, that we have. I think it's it's crucial for ADB to to train its uh, resident missions as well as headquarters uh, staff on on the local context. Uh, and and coming back to my previous point of projects that are not designed based on on uh, on the context, including fragility, uh, are are set up to be to be failures. Uh, so that that's that's a, a crucial point. And, and, and also uh, a relevant point on, uh, uh, on support to the counterpart institutions on, on fragility, uh, raising their, uh, uh, their capacity uh, and, and uh, also helping them with, with understanding what the FSA guidelines are and, and how that could be taken uh, into consideration when designing as well as implementation of, of, of projects is, is, uh, is, is important. One thing that is, is, is a driver of fragility in, in almost all cases is, is its impacts on the population and, the, and their uh, livelihoods. I think private sector plays is a crucial role in this and bringing private sector more into this discussion is, is important because the resources uh, that that the governments as well as the international IFIs, including ADB, bring to the table are uh, are limited. Private sector can play a crucial role. And the last, but but a very important point is a collaboration between implementation partners. There are a lot of of lessons learned. And if, if those are collaborated, you know, that this means better implementation, uh, better use of resources, lower levels of duplication. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you, Mr. Bayan. Maybe we can extend these, uh, this question also to Christine and Ryutoru. Um, in, in your view, what are the most crucial things that need to be done to ensure that no one gets left behind in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, first with Christine. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much for this uh, important question. Um, I think I think the 
the ideas of the of the FCAS approach of ADB, they, they all go into the right direction. Um, first is a very good context analysis. Uh, and then figuring out um, what has to be done, but also to, and I think this is really important, um, to to integrate all these um, analysis and the results of the analysis into the uh, operations and also into the into the different elements of your strategy 2030. If you do that, I think that is that would be really really important. And Minister Payenda, I think he made a very good point on the private sector window. I think this is this is important um, because um, we see that, um, especially in fragile and conflict uh, affected situations, um, there is of course less risk appetite. And I am glad that, uh, for example, in the current uh, ADF 13. Um, there is, we, we managed to have a special um, private sector window just to address these, um, these, uh, these, these questions. And I think that is important. And I would like to come back to what Sana Johnson said, that um, it is so important to overcome the silos. It is really important that we focus on a better cooperation, on a better collaboration. As I said, not everything has to be invented from scratch. There are a lot of assessments, a lot of analysis, a lot of experience from other organizations who also work on the ground. And if that is really more used and if there are synergies, I think that that would be um, a very good, uh, a very good step towards a, a better um, addressing of uh, no one leaving behind. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, very thoughtful comments and then bringing it back um, to collaboration, not needing to reinvent the wheels, and partnership being a very important part of it. Thank you. Um, -san, your thoughts. Thank you. So very quickly, three points. One is the institutional capacity building. We value very much the capacity development of uh, government institutions, particularly in fragile uh, settings. And it's not only uh, providing a good public services, but uh, we have to build an inclusive, responsive, and accountable uh, institutions, public institutions that can uh, enhance the public trust to the government so that we will have a harmonized uh, so, uh, society or so strengthened uh, social cohesion. So that's one thing. And secondly, uh, ADB and JICA has been very actively working uh, on the quality infrastructure. And when I say multi-sectoral uh, approach is very important, uh, infrastructure development is also important for FCAS and CIS. And when we uh, talk about the quality infrastructure, it's, uh, in, it includes the inclusive, uh, resilient, and environmentally sustainable uh, infrastructure. So I think uh, having, a, having a more harmonized uh, context analysis and the fragility assessment we can more effectively deal with the inclusiveness and the resilience of infrastructure development as well. And thirdly, uh, I think Christine and Sana has already mentioned, but the, the nexus of humanitarian de and development, uh, these two actors should work hand in hand. And that's very important in dealing with the pockets of fragility, because in the Asia Pacific, we see a lot of pockets of fragility and there we need to work very uh, more and more effectively uh, with the humanitarian organizations as well. So we very much look forward to do that. Thank you very much, Monsani uh, san um, um, you know, uh, Christine and Minister Payanda talked about private sector and private sector development. And I think that's a very salient point and the importance of that in FCAS and SIDS and perhaps you might have a few words, uh, your thoughts to share on um, uh, what uh, is being done, what can be done. Christine brought up the fact that there's a small private sector set aside to, uh, to catalyze uh, more private sector investments in the small island developing states. Um, you there. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sam, for your question. Um, indeed, um, we do have, uh, we have several activities related to private sector participation. Um, we are, we do a two prong approach. First is, uh, we help improve the environment for private sector, uh, investments to come in. 
And uh, for in the Pacific, we are doing this through policy-based operations, complemented by technical assistance, including our large technical assistance financed with other donors, which is called the Private Sector Development Initiative. Now, um, complementing uh, this uh, operations in uh, policy-based uh, Policy-based policy -based supports and policy-based support and technical assistance. We also have, uh, as Kristen did mention, the ADF 13 Pacific uh, ADF 13 private sector window, uh, which enables us to make co-investments and partnerships in sectors with high potential for social and environmental impacts. And this includes uh, investments potentially in in the health edu and education sectors renewable energy and agribusiness, amongst others. Uh, at the same time, uh, we do have uh, our colleagues. Uh, we work with our private sector operations department, uh, which has a new approach and strategy for the region uh, beginning this year. Uh, we do have, uh, there's greater focus on renewable energy and financial institutions. And we also have a trade finance program uh, that helps increase access to finance uh, for MSMEs through credit guarantees and loans to local banks. So in sum, uh, in sum uh, private sector participation is encouraged through policy support, technical assistance, and specific support uh, for uh, investments, uh, uh, for specific support uh, for investments. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Leah. And um, Sana, uh, there's been some mention of the humanitarian peace development nexus, which I think is very important. Uh, in the past, perhaps uh, we all worked in our silos and there was mentioning earlier that we should work out of our silos. And, you know, ADB is a development organization. We do development work. There are humanitarian organizations. And they do humanitarian work, but more and more as humanitarian issues become protracted in our region, um, there needs to be greater collaboration. I think more and more specifically in the Pacific, as we see that uh, Minister Alfred talked about rising sea levels and climate change, and then the issue of, of, of migration becomes a bigger um, Maybe you can add a few words on that and, and, and share with us your thoughts, uh, Sana. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. No, I mean, as everyone has been saying, uh, I think we as humanitarian actor needs to embrace the importance of actually thinking long term. And of course, we, we are embracing and welcoming many governments now looking into how development um, actions can actually be become more quick, uh, respond quicker. And, and I would say the, the German government's approach to COVID has been extremely helpful for many of us as um, INGOs and NGOs because they released funds very rapidly and allowed us to work with governments and civil society. So um, I think it's an obligation on us as humanitarian actors that after the first 72 hours, we need to see how our investments are actually having a long-term perspective. And uh, I hope that development actors will see that with the underfunding uh, of the humanitarian sector, we are actually losing out the in-between. And it's nothing really strange. It's literally to think, how can we utilize our resources the best? Um, for, uh, immediate lives, or we take a long-term perspective. And the world is evolving. Uh, Afghanistan received last year close to a 1 million people returning from Iran and Pakistan. It's enormous pressure and it is in a time where climate have uh, given over 16 million people. Uh, I mean, 16, people are hung 16 million people are hungry in Afghanistan. We have a peace process. So the complexity are, are enormous, like many things in life <laughs> right now. But I think, uh, as mentioned, we need to work together. We need to think long term, even when we do short term um actions and utilize the existing resources. Christine mentioned capacity building of ADB staff. We do have a humanitarian academy, 2000 courses. So I do hope uh, ADB will 
take the opportunity to work with us there. And I hope we as humanitarian actors will take learning from um, longstanding humanitarian ac uh, d development actors and your knowledge so that we can merge and come together. Uh, it's the only way forward, but we need to be quick. We need to be agile and we need to be respectful to our clients because they are the one who should guide us on what to do, uh, not live in our own perception of what is needed, but actually listen to what they are asking for and respond duly. Indeed, indeed. Thank you very much, Sana. Uh, thank you very much for those points. Um, there have been several questions on the question board about COVID and the impact of COVID. And, uh, and I think we'll go to the two ministers again, uh, Minister Alfred and then Mr. Minister Paenda. Uh, what has been the greatest challenge that has been faced by small island developing states in the face of COVID-19? Um, Minister Alfred, please. Minister Alfred, I think you're still in mute. Uh, yes, my, my, my apologies. Uh, fortunately, yeah, for the case of the Marshall Islands, we continue to be COVID-19 free. No community level transmission has occurred yet, despite two border cases that were contained. Uh, but I would say that uh, we, with the dilapidated state of, of our infrastructure, the possibility of COVID-19 entering our borders is a scary proposition. I think, um, uh, well, what we should uh, put some emphasis on is to ensure that our, our uh, infrastructure are, are adequately set in place to, to be able to uh, receive whatever services and needs are uh, required for containing or um, uh, other health health uh, action that need to be taken, not only for prevention, but in the case that COVID-19 enters the enters our borders, then we should be able to serve, serve as a wide, wide uh, spec spectrum of the community. Uh, given the geographical setup of the uh, country, it's important that we have ready access even to the most outlying atolls in the Marshalls. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Alfred. I think that's right. I think uh, preparedness and having the infrastructure there and the human resources there for the preparedness to respond in case there are cases, I think is an important. I think also perhaps um, the economic impacts, Not maybe it's good, it's wonderful that you have not had the number of cases in the Marshall Islands, but the economic impact because of closed borders, I'm sure have had an impact also. Um, now over to uh, Minister Payenda. Um, and how has uh, Afghanistan dealt with or addressed and, and coped uh, COVID-19? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, uh, luckily, we did not have a lot of uh, human casualties. Uh, the resistance levels, uh, I don't know what the reasons were uh, of higher in, in Afghans, but it has taken a toll on, 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 on our economy. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's uh, contracted two to four percent. Uh, final figures to be to be issued, but it has taken a toll on 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 our road to self reliance. We've committed to increase domestic revenues, but domestic revenues declined sixteen percent last year. It also take a toll on our programming of expenditure. Ten percent more expenditures for for COVID, but the devil is in the details. A lot of uh, Programs, uh, normal development had to be uh, had to be uh, re rerouted to address uh, uh, effects of, of of COVID. So it has been a disruption in our programming. So a lot of uh, long-term projects had to be cancelled to make room for 
for uh, humanitarian and immediate um, needs of, of the population in response to, to, to the COVID. There have been a few bright spots as well. I've seen a, a, a jump, you know, I've, having been out of the government for two years and coming back. It, it's, it's been a, a leap in digitization. You know, we have a lot of uh, uh, use of, you know, use of uh, technology uh, and, and, and our not only communications, but, you know, uh, digital ID cards have, have uh, 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 the distribution has gone up uh, by leaps and bounds. We've we've had a digitization of tax payment, custom clearance, and and uh, uh, some other services that are de delivered by by the government. And um, so so that has been uh, that has been uh, the impact of uh, COVID. Hopefully, the second and the third and and, and the subsequent waves. Uh, would not have any catastrophic uh, impacts and we are able to then get back slowly back to, to normal development. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Panda. Um, good to hear that um, uh, uh, the positive thinking going forward. I'm, I'm going to now um, move to the closing uh, remarks and um, thank you very much for the questions that everybody posed. Um, and I pass this on to my boss, the Director General for Sustainable Development Climate Change, uh, Bruno Carrasco. Bruno. Thank you very much, Sam. Excellencies, panelists, and participants, we now come to the end of this excellent session. I would like to extend my deepest gratitude to the panelists for their informative statements and rich discussions today. <clears throat> Thank you to the Honorable Alfred Alfred Jr., Secretary of Finance from the Republic of the Marshall Islands, for his points on climate change and the vulnerabilities on, of the Pacific Islands, as well as the need for capacity development and private sector investment. I would also like to thank the Honorable Khalid Payenda, Afghanistan Finance Minister, on the discussions of conflict and navigating through such a dynamic environment, as well as further emphasizing the need for flexibility to adapt to these challenges. A very important point that he raised also was the need to have properly designed project in FCAS and SIDS countries. I would likewise give thanks to Ms. Christine Totske, Director of Germany's Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, on highlighting the need for tighter collaboration and coordination with development partners and to build in context, as she highlighted, into the analysis and operations. Mr. Ryutaro Murotani, uh, head of the Office for Peacebuilding in JICA, on his discussion of the humanitarian development nexus and resilience against conflict, risk, and disasters, including highlighting the importance of the subregional nature in some cases, as well as the importance of multidimensional nature of uh, risks. And finally, to Ms. Sena Johnson, Vice President of the Asia Region of the International Rescue Committee on citing the importance of the role that civil society plays in development operations and localizing contexts, and working, as she quoted, hand in hand among partners and stakeholders. I would like to recognize as well our ADB representatives in this session, Vice President Bambang Susantonio, Director General Lea Gutierrez, and FCAS advisor Samuel Tamiwa. As we close this session, I would like to share three takeaways. First, on the comprehensive changes in how ADB will work in FCAS and SIDS. As you may know, at ADB, we increasingly operate under a combined one ADB yet country differentiated approach. The FSA was very much response to this prerogative. Each of the FSA's three pillars, as you heard, will lead to significant changes in how ADB approaches our work in FCAS and SIDS. The 13 key action areas and 34 specific sub-actions will be our roadmap to implementing and institutionalizing the FCAS and SIDS approach, or FSA, including changes in key guidance documents from staff instructions and guidance notes to the project administration memorandum. We also will monitor and evaluate our actions closely to make sure they adapt to the dynamic environments in FCAS and SIDS and remain relevant. Next, on context specificity and risk-informed decision-making as the foundation of operations in FCAS and SIDS. 
both country planning and project preparation and implementation procedures will change. Country planning and programming processes will focus on upstream analytical work to ensure the context specificity of country operations, especially through the fragility and resilience assessments. Based on these comprehensive assessments, projects will be designed for the specific context of each country and will form the basis for risk-informed decision-making during implementation. And finally, on knowledge and analytics to enhance skills and change mindsets. Knowledge products and training programs are crucial to enhance understanding of the business, uh, of the new business processes, excuse me, procedures and guidelines for both ADB and project counterpart staff. Our new FCAS and SIDS database will track historical trends to better inform our decisions. We will also create knowledge sharing platforms and through partnerships and collaboration, including with participants in today's panel, bring in global good practices to, to our operations. These products will improve our insights into the drivers of fragility and how to help address them. We have a significant task ahead of us to implement the FSA and provide our poorest and most vulnerable developing member countries with the support they need. However, and more importantly, as you've heard earlier, we are delighted to announce that we have a solution. Last week, the FCAS and SIDS approach was approved by our president, and we are very pleased to officially launch it today. We will be sending all of the attendees an advanced copy of the FCAS and SIDS approach immediately after this event. In the coming weeks, we will have the published version available on our website. Let's get started. Thank you very much for attending this session and we look forward to seeing you in person again soon. Stay safe and keep well, everyone. Thank you once again. The meeting, the seminar is now adjourned. Thank you.